You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. One of Leonardo da Vinci's most famous works is not housed in a museum. It's in the convent of Santa Maria in Milan, Italy. It seems totally fitting that a depiction of the Last Supper was painted on the wall in the convent's dining hall. Visitors today are often surprised by how enormous the work is. The people are life-sized on this massive 15 by 29 foot painting. Another surprising fact is that while people flock to see Leonardo's work on the wall of the convent, very little, if any, of what we see there today was actually painted by Leonardo da Vinci. I feel like who art ed? Who tried to spice it? Who art ed? Mr. Wood art ed me. <laughs> yeah. Either way, it, it's <laughs> ambiguous. It, it works on so many levels. I know. I thought it's a great start. Welcome to Who Arted, where we explore visual arts in an audio medium. I'm your host, Kyle Wood. And for this week's Fun Fact Friday mini episode, we're going to be focusing on Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. Da Vinci's Last Supper painting is well known throughout the world and referenced in numerous works of popular culture, including the famous novel turned movie, The Da Vinci Code. As with anything famous, there seems to be a number of incredible theories popping up directly proportionate to its fame. While there may not be a global conspiracy, there is some symbolism in the work, but we can get into that later. First, let's talk about how it was made. Leonardo da Vinci painted The Last Supper from 1495 to 1498. While many people think it's a fresco, Leonardo didn't work that fast. Frescoes are painted in wet plaster, and they must be completed before the plaster sets. Leonardo da Vinci was well known for taking a long time to complete his works. This one took three years, and that was relatively quick for him. Some would say he may have had ADHD, and while we cannot diagnose him 500 years later, we do know that he tended to procrastinate. He moved from project to project as different ideas captured his attention, and he struggled to finish his work. His slow process meant that Leonardo could not really work in that wet plaster, which would permanently seal the pigment into the wall. Instead, the scientifically-minded artist decided to experiment. He used tempera and oil paint layered on the surface, and sadly, this experiment was a bit of a failure. While it no doubt looked brilliant when it was created, Leonardo's painting began to flake off the wall within a few years. For centuries, there were heavy-handed restorations, damage due to flooding, mold, even a bomb hitting the building during World War II. While the painting itself wasn't hit, the roof was partially blown off, and while outdoor dining may be delightful when the weather cooperates, it's not ideal for the Last Supper. An intensive 20-year restoration was completed in 1999, and while they did tremendous work removing layers of grime and bringing out a lot of the details that were previously not seen, it was controversial as little of Leonardo's brushwork remains at this point. I would say that the value of the artwork is not in whose hand held the brush, but the way the work resonates with the viewer. So I'm personally all for any restoration efforts that help us to see the image better. Now, with that history behind us, let's consider what we see in The Last Supper. The Last Supper is a depiction of the story of Jesus meeting with his apostles just before the crucifixion. Or I guess just before he was captured by the Romans, put on trial, and then crucified. Jesus is the central figure surrounded by his disciples, who are all at the table as he tells them that he knows someone there has betrayed him. It's a high drama moment played out beautifully. In an age before film or reality television, pictures were the only means of bringing these stories to life. I've always heard people talk about how literacy rates were low back in the day and the church would commission artists to illustrate these important biblical stories as a means of educating people. But it's kind of hard to imagine anyone in the convent sitting there having their lunch, then looking up at the painting and having that sort of moment of realization like, oh, that's what I've dedicated my life to. I suppose maybe it served as a reminder, keeping the the Bible sort of front of mind at all times. But I also think 
some level the symbolism embedded in the work is more to reach those already well-versed in the story. The thoughtful depiction of each figure signals that Leonardo was a clever man, and it makes the audience feel clever for understanding the references. So now let's get into some of those references. First of all, Jesus, as I said, was the central figure in this, which obviously would make sense. The New Testament really is all about the life of Jesus and his teachings, and so it would it would make sense for him to be literally central in this picture. Leonardo da Vinci actually hammered a nail into the wall and tied a string to it to capture the linear perspective and create a realistic sense of depth in the piece. When you look at it, it feels as if you could walk right into that space. And Jesus is the central figure right over the vanishing point. So all of those guidelines in the linear perspective serve to lead the viewer's eye right to him. Thomas is standing to Jesus' right with an index finger pointed upward. People debate the intention of this. Some people say he's pointing up towards the heavens. Um, Maybe it's gesturing, sort of talking with his hands. But a lot of people look at this as sort of an Easter egg. For those in the know, Thomas was the figure who was said to have needed to probe Jesus' wounds to confirm his identity. So that finger up in the air is sort of referencing the finger that he put into the holes in the resurrected Jesus to confirm that it was in fact him coming back from the dead. Another interesting bit of symbolism we see is with Judas. Now Judas was the figure who betrayed Jesus, giving him up to the Romans. And we see he appears to have a little a sack, maybe the the pieces of silver that he collected as a bounty. But also we see he spilled the salt. And spilling the salt is sort of a a reference that actually works on two levels. The symbolism, some people would would point out, spilling salt as a an omen of bad luck, and that could be signifying Judas's bad luck for being the one who has to have that infamy and has to carry out that role as the betrayer. But also, there is a Near Eastern expression, betraying the salt, and that is meant to be betraying uh, one's master. And so, like I said, the spilled salt is a symbol doing sort of double duty within this depiction. Now, while Leonardo da Vinci's painting of The Last Supper is sadly faded quite significantly over time, we do have some nice clues as to what it looked like in its original form, mostly because there are older works that are oil on canvas painted by other artists like Andrea Solari, um, who painted his version of Leonardo's work in 1520. And there are newer interpretations made by modern and contemporary artists like Salvador Dali and Andy Warhol. There was even an artist, Vic Muniz, who made his out of chocolate syrup. So I guess that was sort of a last supper and dessert. Pretty sweet. This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted, part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. If you found this tolerable, please leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week on social media at Who Arted Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And of course, on the website, whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.